Delta runs through the forest and howls to the heavens, accompanied by a red and macabre moon, after which, the scene cuts to a sacred temple, and Beta comments that they have not seen any activity on the part of the Diablo's cult in the Midgar Kingdom. And this has continued like this since the incident at the Bushin Festival, and the girl continues explaining that the smaller sects were already paralyzed, and as for the Fenrir sect, it was being restructured, but it seems to have been immobilized due to all this confusion. And upon hearing this, the other girls say that things are going according to her plans, and the other explains that they now have the freedom to define their future goals, and also focus their primary efforts on the situation in the Oriana Kingdom. However Ada says they still have a problem, she explains that there has been a recent acceleration in the flow of funds, going directly to the lawless city. And Beta adds, saying that this region does not belong to any nation, it would be a kind of slum abandoned by evil, and any tension that occurs in that city will not have the slightest weight for the rest of society. And well, Ganma comments that she would like to just focus on their plan, but still, she thinks the right thing to do would be to send additional people to the location immediately. And then Shadow says he can smell blood coming from there, and states that the city is bathed in blood right now, and speaking of which, they look at the moon, and notice it red. And they immediately remember the tragedy of a thousand years ago, so they deduce that if nothing is done, the lawless city and neighboring cities will suffer serious consequences. So Alpha tells everyone to be silent, and says that if the red moon event is close, they shouldn't stand around and look idly at it, and says that the right thing would be for them to go and solve the problem, since they are the seven of the shadow. But Shadow says he will take care of everything himself, in fact he is interested in the money, but Beta says he shouldn't go there alone. And Epsilon agrees with her, saying that he shouldn't go, because if he dies, they will be without his help. But he says that there is nothing they should fear, as the moon only turned red, and nothing more. Then Alpha laughs, saying that before him, even the legendary red moon is stripped of its dignity, and he says that he thinks the red moon is more beautiful than that color. In this, the seven shadows say that the fact that he is with them allows them to see the beauty of the moon, even if it is red, and well, the girls wish him good luck and begin to say a prayer. And Shadow praises Alpha for how he managed to make the girls so skilled to the point of making a new red moon appear, however he comes back with disdain, saying that it is nothing more than a simple moon of another color. And meanwhile in the lawless city, two men talk about the Crimson Tower ruled by the Blood Queen, who is one of the three rulers of the lawless city. And well, they look at the vampire castle behind them, and they say that not even the body-snatching vultures would dare to go near there, as they believe that if we get close they will be transformed into terrible ghouls. Then one of the men asks if his friend is scared of that, but he says no, and claims that the place is just a meeting point for a bunch of inmates. And at that moment an evil being appears, and says that they are not worthy of passing through the castle gate, as the only ones authorized are the Blood Queen servants or guests, besides them, only powerful warriors can pass through the gate. And they say that they are not servants or allies of the Queen, but powerful warriors who are there to hunt her, but the being bursts into laughter, saying that they are both more foolish than him. And he takes off his cloak, preparing for combat, and claims that he was thrown there as a simple pathetic guard dog, because he lost his arm. However, the two warriors do not lower their heads, and Goldie gives information to the toy monster, he says that his power level is 4315, so the being says that he was once like him, and reveals that he was called of White Devil. At this, Goldie's friend is perplexed, as he recognized him as a criminal who had a huge bounty placed on his head, however the monster now says that he is nothing more than a simple guard dog. And he says that his only joy at the moment is to destroy idiots like the two heroes, because they don't know where they belong, so a duel begins between the three, and they fight all night, until dawn in the city, and soon we can see Shadow walking there. And the boy comes to the conclusion that the lawless city is worse than he thought, the place was really a depraved trash, but his sister tells him to keep quiet, so that he doesn't attract attention. And well, he asks if it wasn't time for them to go to the Crimson Tower, but the girl says no, as she should go to the Dark Knights Association first, for a strategic meeting. But Shadow says he's never heard of these people, and Claire explains that this is because they have their own order of knights, so it's not an official organization, and she says the organization was founded for knights who don't belong to any institution. Public. And as she explains, Shadow remembers his senior year in high school, where he was on his way to becoming an eminence in Shadow, when suddenly his journey came to an abrupt end. And after many events in his life, he arrives at his current point, where his sister fought and won the Bushin Festival Championship, and well, to celebrate he used his proximity to Ganma to dress elegantly and gracefully. Furthermore, the guy even had a fancy dinner at a restaurant in Mitsugoshi, however, in the middle of the tour, Claire says she wants to go to the lawless city to exterminate the vampires. And in fact that's what she did, right after a fight she got on the train and went to another, 
so Shadow wonders how his sister is so cold-blooded. And she says that she only brought him with her to hint at his future, because if he does everything she says, Claire will open a place for him in the Order of Midgar's Knights. In this he understands that his sister is trying to expand his CV, so that he can become a public servant, and thinking further, he comes to the conclusion that he did not in fact plan anything to do after graduating. And Shadow remembers that his sister will inherit the estate out in the country, and it makes him think he'll just be thrown into some random job there, but that doesn't bother him, for Shadow he doesn't mind doing any service as long as he can do what he wants. Then his sister questions what he wants, but he says it's a secret that he keeps under lock and key, but his sister claims that he never actually thought about what to do, so he would just be inventing something to not let it be revealed. And well, at that moment an animal dealer stops them, calling Claire a beautiful young woman, and after flattering the girl, he offers his service, saying that he has beautiful pets for sale. But she asks if the merchant called her beautiful, and he says he's talking about her, the most beautiful girl in the world, so she says he has good views, but Shadow's Killjoy says the man is just forcing her bar with her. But she tells him to be quiet, and introduces her first pet, the Dark Knight, Little Goldie, the merchant says that this is an animal that suits her very much. However, Claire complains about him being all beaten up and says that they should handle their products with a little more care, and well, the merchant says that his animal is worth 30 million zenny. And as they negotiate, Shadow approaches him, finding the animal familiar, and seeing that the girl was refusing, the merchant negotiates another animal for her, called Cue Ball Quinton, he says she could have both for less than 40 million of zenny. But Shadow says that the animal is split in half, so the merchant understands the situation, and lowers the price to 37 million zenny, but Claire says she's not interested anyway. And then Shadow looks at his product again, and finds the animal familiar again, well, Claire rests her hand on Shadow's head and tells the merchant that she already has all the pets she needs. And when looking at the boy, the merchant understands that she prefers younger animals, and starts talking about an animal that is about to arrive, but Claire pulls her brother and they continue on their way. He then says that he can't walk if she always drags him, but she says that if she doesn't keep her hands on him, the boy will get lost, but he says no, and the two of them get into this silly little fight, until that actually happens. Shadow leaves the inn where they were staying for a minute and is already lost, and then a loose guy passes by him, pushing him, and ends up losing his wallet, who told him to keep hesitating. And besides him, Shadow cleans up everyone who crosses his path, and as night falls, he gets even more wallets very easily, leaving him very surprised. Until, while walking through the city, Shadow finds a group of men beating up a ghoul, and their excuse is that one of the guys lost one of their bets, while the other one got stumped by the woman, and that all justified the beating against the man. Cool. And then the boy analyzes the situation, and says that these vampire subordinates have a lot of HP, so they serve very well as a punching bag there, and all that was exactly what Shadow expected from the lawless city, a city soaked in blood and slaughter. And well, when looking at the sky, he sees the red moon, and accompanied by this, he is overcome by a sensation of magical energy, and when he looks back at the guys beating the ghoul, the men are amazed at how resistant that creature was. Then the monster gets up, and attacks one of the men, in which Shadow remembers that after a human is bitten by a ghoul, he becomes one of the creatures, but all of this would just be rumors, until the boy sees the man transforming with the your own eyes. However, he says that this happened because the red moon was stimulating everyone to the city's magical energy, and he understands that if he doesn't do anything, the ghouls will continue to multiply. So he wonders what to do, and thinks he should run away, or stay silent and play the mysterious young man again, saying that everything that happens in the lawless city stays there. And while he is doing his amazing action, a red-haired girl looks at him and notices him about to be attacked, so she attacks the monsters that were about to kill him, he then questions who she is. And the girl introduces herself as Mary, the former vampire hunter, and asks him to run away from there, if he values his life, after all the frenzy had started at that moment, because the moon was red. And after giving the message, she leaves, and Shadow stays behind, stunned by the girl's beauty, wondering what that feeling he was feeling was. And meanwhile, Claire returns to the inn, and soon realizes that her brother didn't obey her, and ended up leaving there, and well, a man runs out of the neighboring room, as his lady of the night had turned into a ghoul, out of the blue. However, the beast is contained by Claire, and she asks the man if he had seen a boy with black hair and eyes there, but he replies no, so the girl leaves the inn to hunt the fugitive. And meanwhile, two Neanderthals eager to perform libidinous acts, observe a woman passing by on the street, they then comment that the academy could not expel them, as they will never find them in that city. And given the freedom they have in that place, the guys decide to attack the woman, but they are stopped by a horde of ghouls, and well, Mary was in her room, and laments about her loving professional life, yes, the girl is a lady of the night, until suddenly she hears the sound of fighting in the street, 
and when looking out the window, Mary sees the ghouls and gets distracted, then one of them enters her room ready to eat her in the literal sense, after all her shift is already over. It was over. However, she is saved by Shadow, who tells her to run, if she values her life, yes, we have a little catchphrase thief here. Well, he explains that the frenzy has already started, and says that they're out of time, yes, the guy stole all her phrases, well, Mary questions who he could be, and he says he's Shadow, but there's no room for much conversation, and again tells her to run away. And then one of her friends goes to her room, talking about the existence of countless ghouls outside the building, but when she gets there she notices everything destroyed, and Mary explains that it was Shadow's work. Then her friend says she's already heard of him, and describes him as the evil genius, and says he's already had a field day beating up corrupt clergy, meaning the guy would be as dangerous a person as any of the rulers of that city. City. Detail, she was talking about the lawless city, however Mary doesn't think that Shadow could be a bad man, after all he saved her from a ghoul, and well, she decides to leave the city, but her friend warns her that she couldn't break the contract, as she would be persecuted if she did that. But the girl had already made up her mind, and thanks Shadow for giving her enough courage to run away, and meanwhile Yukaim talks to herself and is soon surprised by other girls, who warn her about the vampires having ghoul soldiers around the city. And well, Claire cries next to Sid, regretting having brought him to such a horrible place, then Mary appears behind her, asking if she would be the girl who goes around asking about a boy with black hair and black eyes. And she says yes, but she already found him, but Mary looks at her with a frown, saying that the boy in her arms doesn't have the characteristics she described. And indeed when she looks closely at the man, she realizes that it wasn't her brother, and then Mary says that she met two boys who match Claire's descriptions, and she explains that she saw the first boy when the moon was starting to set. Red, and he was standing in front of an angry ghoul, but he was smiling. But upon hearing this, Claire says that it couldn't be her brother, as she can't imagine him smiling, so Mary describes the second boy as a young dark knight, and Claire asks to know where he was. And she says that this young man was about to be taken by the Blood Queen's followers, that is, they took him to the Crimson Tower, and Mary explains that their idea is to offer her brother as a sacrifice to the Blood Queen. But Claire doesn't understand anything, so the girl tells her that this sacrifice is to awaken Queen Elizabeth from her thousand-year sleep, and for that, they need the blood of a living young man. However, Claire didn't know that the Queen would be sleeping, this was news to her, and Mary explains that this fact was kept secret, as they were waiting for the right time to do it, so that they could give surreal power to vampires, and the long-awaited moment was precisely that night, where the red moon would rise again. Claire notices that the moon has indeed seemed redder in recent days, and Mary explains that that red light also affects the sleeping queen, and with the blood of the sacrifice as a catalyst, she will certainly wake up. And well, a horde of ghouls appear, and Mary tries to reassure the girl, saying that her brother is certainly still alive, after all they would need the blood of a living young man, and she reveals that her target is also Queen Elizabeth, and to find her, she will have to go to the Crimson Tower as well. Therefore, they are heading in the same direction, and Claire commits to working with her, and the two begin annihilating a horde of ghouls together, and as they run, Mary explains that entry to the ground floor will be difficult, but she states that there is a way to do this. And besides them, the Neanderthals from before also run, until one of them stumbles and falls behind, and already at the top of the tower, Juggernaut observes all the movement in the city, and gets excited about it, as a great battle was about to happen. And he remembers that the last great the battle you saw was when Therianthrope suffered an invasion a long time ago, and well, there is general chaos down there, the association's knights were cornered by the ghouls. Until a giant horde of them takes over the entrance to the main street, leaving them even more trapped, but they are restrained by shadow, then he tells the knights to run if they value their lives, that's right, that phrase has become the crazy man's Pokemon mantra. And meanwhile, Chief Crimson is warned that preparations for the sacrifice are almost ready, furthermore, their takeover of the city is proceeding as planned. However, he states that there are parts of the city where they are encountering unexpected resistance, so Crimson says he is already aware of who is behind this. And he reveals that they would be Yukaim, the spiritual fox and ruler of the White Tower, besides her, there is the Juggernaut, the tyrant and ruler of the Black Tower, but Crimson says he is not worried about them, after all, both will end when the Blood Queen awakens. However, his assistant reveals that there is someone besides them, a person who is walking around the city killing ghouls, and returning there, Juggernaut and Yukaim fight against the beasts, and then they become strange and start a fight between themselves. And Shadow observes this from above them, saying that things continue as before, because for him, someone somewhere must be trying to tell a new story, but unlike everyone else, he claims that he never changes, his biggest goal is still to become the eminence in the shadow. Then the boy goes to the two, 
and introduces himself as Shadow, the one who hides in the shadow, to hunt the shadows. A man kills other humans, saying that killing is what gives meaning to his life, as he felt at the top of this fight for survival, until the ghouls took over the place, making his desire to kill more challenging. Well, he is tied up and arrested, and then he recognizes a giant cleaver as Juggernaut, the tyrannical ruler of the Dark Tower, besides him, the man notices Yukaim, the ruler of the White Tower, with her distinctive nine tails, which is one of the symbols of the Therianthropes of the highest rank. And these two rulers are in combat, and as they are two respected figures, he feels that he would never be able to defeat them, and this makes him regret why they would have to be in his territory. Until a third appears, introducing himself to the two as Shadow, the one who hides in the shadows to hunt shadows, but Juggernaut appears not to know him. Then Yukaim says that he is the Don of the Armed Militants who took the capital Midgar Royal as their territory, at which the giant cleaver remembers the boy, and says that he is the leader of the gang that massacred those snobbish priests. However, he says that it is none of his business and makes his way through destroying the castle gate, to leave, saying that he will kill Yukaim at another opportunity, but before going, Shadow says that the light is red, starting the frenzy. And then Yukaim asks if this refers to the current problem with the ghouls, and Juggernaut says he remembers what Shadow is talking about, and asks if it would be that legend of the red light, which said that three kingdoms fell when he was in the sky. And then he says it will be good for him, and intends to start her training with those bats. Well, Yukaim changes the subject, and thanks Shadow for helping some of her girls in the Pleasure District, and she says she hopes they can be minimally friendly with each other. And well, everyone starts to leave, and the man from before stays behind, and says that the entire castle gate is an artifact that would be impossible to break with a sword, and he is surprised by Juggernaut's strength. And then he goes back to worrying about those two rulers, as they are both after the Blood Queen, and he also comes back to regret being imprisoned, as he wanted to kill some humans. Then he notices the presence of that guy who appeared out of nowhere in the fight, but he doesn't recognize him, and says that he doesn't feel any power coming from him, so he deduces that Shadow is weaker than him. And then he smiles and goes to attack, but his body is split in half, and Shadow repeats those phrases again, saying that the moon is red and that the frenzy has already started, leaving them without much time. Well, the scene cuts to Beta reading a book, where she reads about the technology present at a certain time, in which she concludes that the cult's level of technology was incredible, and the source of this power was found in the demon. And this fascinates her, but Beta wonders where they could have found the knowledge necessary to harness such power, and then suddenly the other girls arrive, and Mary claims that they managed to enter the tower successfully. And Claire is incredulous at the fact that the passage turns into a slide that connects to this location, well, the girl notices the arrival of the intruders, and wonders what she should do now. And although she thinks about eliminating the witnesses, Beta doesn't think she could do that, and she tells Claire that she doesn't want to fight her, so Claire asks if the girl knows her. And Beta says that she is the winner of the recent Bushin festival, and Mary says that the girl appears to be a vampire, and explains that they have no time to fight unnecessary battles, in addition, she notices that Beta is not unaccompanied. Then the two children who are with her question why Beta continues to hide her face, and well, the girls question who Beta would be, and she responds that she is from Shadow Garden, and Claire remembers that this is the same group of punks who burned down their school. And she asks if Beta would burn the tower too, but the girl says she was just researching the possessed, but the reason she says she can't explain, and to continue her research, she needs a blood sample from a progenitor vampire. Then Mary questions the relationship between progenitor vampires and the possessed, and Beta explains that when tracking the origins of these two species, she discovered that they are both the same. And to explain this, she deduces that in the process of descent the lineages changed and separated, as this would be a plausible hypothesis, and to test it, it became necessary for her and her team to study the Blood Queen, after all she is a vampire progenitor. However, Mary says this is blasphemy against the parents, and Beta questions why this makes her angry, but at the same time she shows that she knows Mary too, calling her a thousand-year-old rumor, who holds the position of an ancient vampire hunter. She is then surprised by the fact that Beta knows her too, and Beta suggests that they both stay out of each other's way, and Claire asks a question. She asks if it is possible to cure the possessed, to which the girl just replies that they don't need to worry about that issue, so Claire tells Mary to hurry up, as they need to save her brother, and then the girls would just be wasting time. And upon hearing this, Beta is amazed and asks to know more about it, and Claire explains that the people there kidnapped him, and if they don't hurry he will be used as a sacrifice for the Blood Queen. And then the girl called, number 666, appears, and asks if that's true, but Beta tells her to be quiet, and the girl apologizes for that, and Claire says that the matter between them ends there, and turns her back to leave, 
telling Beta to fulfill the agreement not to get in their way. But before the two leave, Beta asks if Mary doesn't have the desire to fight for Haven one more time, she then hears that with a certain fear, but turns around and continues on her way, so Beta tells number 666 to behave, and asks the other two to keep the girl in line from now on. And then Beta reinforces that their mission is to obtain the sample and nothing more, as Lord Shadow will already take care of the Blood Queen, and this will eliminate all problems, including the issue of sacrifice. And finally she asks if number 666 understood her explanation, and the girl replies yes, well, Claire and Mary continue their journey, and kill a vampire on the way, in which Claire explains that even an immortal vampire dies if he has his heart destroyed, in addition, she comments that they don't get along very well in the sun. And Mary just tells them to follow, but on the way Claire asks if her friend was hiding something from her, as she noticed the girl with a strange aura in the library, almost as if she was on the side of the vampires, and then she questions what Mary the First was actually looking for it. And she says that she was in search of the Blood Queen, as she lived her entire life just to achieve that purpose, but Claire asks her about what Beta was talking about before, and questions what that port would be. And in addition to these questions, Claire says that although Mary doesn't look like an elf, Beta had said that they knew each other a thousand years ago, so Mary says that a possessed person can never be a human again, and explains that this is so obvious to the point of calling Claire's question stupid. Furthermore, she explains that everyone has their secrets, and asks her not to meddle in hers, and while they were talking, a magical energy took over the environment, and then we can see Juggernaut trying to kill a vampire by crushing his heart. And he says he is disappointed, because that vampire is very weak, and well, he goes to three young vampires and asks where he could find the Blood Queen, and the two girls watch him from afar, and comment that that man is Juggernaut, the tyrant, and the ruler of the Dark Tower. As for the guy he's giving shit to, he would be the third powerful vampire in that tower, and in addition to him, his other two friends also have important titles, which in practice would make them difficult enemies. However, Juggernaut finishes off the three without any apparent difficulty, and Mary comments that he is in fact very close to becoming one of the most powerful people in the lawless city. And that's why she suggests that they wait for him to leave, as it wouldn't be smart to pick a fight with him, so Claire agrees to do that, but it was too late, the giant cleaver had already found the girls, and he explains that he has sharp instincts. And then Juggernaut punches Claire, knocking her away, so Mary looks away from her enemy, to assess how Claire is doing, and then ends up getting hit too. And Juggernaut says he expected more from the girls, and suggests that his instincts are a little rusty, and when he looks down, he notices Claire stabbing his foot with her sword, but he laughs, showing himself to be excited by the girl's resistance. After all, most of your enemies fall after your first punch. And on the other hand, Claire says that he was the second person who managed to punch her in the face, but he says that this is not worthy of honor for him. Well, she goes to Mary, and notices that the girl was seriously injured, so Claire tries to heal her, but the girl says she's fine, and just asks to suck her blood, that's right, we have a closet vampire. And after sucking her blood, a red aura starts to surround her body, and the girl goes towards Juggernaut, who in turn recognizes her as that annoying bat from before, but he gets emotional, because now he will have a worthy fight. However, he makes it clear that he is still stronger than her, and sends a gust of wind at the two, and Maru says that the blood has not been assimilated for a long time, well, the giant cleaver sprouts from Claire's back. And at that moment everything goes in slow motion for her, so the only thing she does is apologize to her brother Sid, as she was about to go see Jesus, but when she least expects it, Shadow appears to intervene, and sends the big guy away. Then they look at the boy, and as usual he just says that the frenzy has started, and says that they don't have much time, and after repeating these phrases like a parrot, he leaves. And Mary says that this shadow was marked as an enemy by the church, well, she apologizes to Claire for taking her blood at that moment, then the girl says that her lips are hurting from that, but still she says that does not care. And she says that she finally discovered Mary's real secret, which in this case is a vampire, and the girl says that she will reveal everything to Claire, including things about the Blood Queen. And well, she starts by saying that a thousand years ago was a golden age for vampires, as they were able to hunt and devour humans, making them their prey, in addition to drinking their blood for pure leisure. However, times changed after humans discovered the weakness of vampires, and the hunters became the hunted, and thus, all vampires were extinct from the earth in the blink of an eye. And while this was happening, the Blood Queen, Lady Elizabeth, was living with humans, occupying the position of ruler of a small fiefdom, and because she wanted to live in harmony with humans, she gave up blood of her own free will. And as the Queen's followers, she and the others also stopped drinking blood, to follow in her footsteps, and as a result of this, they lost their powers, 
but in return, they gained other things. For example, the ability to live in sunlight, in addition, their thirst for blood decreased, and thus, they were able to live with humans in a harmonious world full of peace. However, this was not Queen Elizabeth's reality, as she still remained crazy about blood, even though she decided to stop consuming it, and as these desires still existed, sunlight continued to burn her skin when exposed. But still, she talked to Mary about turning her castle into a refuge where humans and vampires can live together in happiness. And then Mary explains that the refuge she fought to build actually existed in that place, but after a thousand years, a red moon appeared in the sky, and she was responsible for giving more power to the vampires. And the effect of this on Queen Elizabeth's body was complete chaos, for she was hungry for blood as she had never been before, and then Crimson supplied her with a single drop, and her frenzy would have lasted three long days. As a result, the haven disappeared amid a pile of rubble, in addition to three kingdoms having suffered catastrophic damage, and in the midst of all this chaos, Mary would have survived by licking the blood of the dead, and after that she goes in search of her queen. But when she finally reunited with her, everything was already over, and the queen told her that an event like that should never be repeated, and to that end, Elizabeth asked her to spread her ashes in the ocean, so that her flesh would not be destroyed, will be at risk of reviving. And well, after saying her last words she pierces herself in the heart, and Mary explains that if she were an ordinary vampire, her body would have disintegrated instantly, but the queen's body remained intact even after being burned, causing her to never turn to ashes. And with that, she felt helpless, as she could not defy, much less fulfill her wishes, the only thing that Mary was able to promise was that she would take care of her in her eternal sleep. But she didn't even get that, because Crimson and his followers took Elizabeth from her soon after, and he says that out of respect for Mary's services to the Queen, he would spare her life, and he says he is hoping very much that she chose join them on the next frenzy night, a thousand years from now. And after all these years, Crimson is indeed ambitiously trying to use Queen Elizabeth, and all of this makes Mary question whether she could be worthy of Her Majesty's pardon. Well, Claire says she's no better than her, as she believes she could be possessed too, as she's been showing signs since childhood, and she says that one day she'll become a monster too, but she wishes she could help her brother conquer something in life until the day it happens. It was precisely because she had that in mind that she brought him to that place, but it was her attitude that made him find himself in this embarrassing situation, and Claire regrets it all, and says that she won't be able to forgive herself if Sid suffers anything. And well, she talks about the situation again of Mary, and asks if there is no way to rebuild the Queen's refuge again, but she says that she is afraid of repeating the same mistake as before, in addition, Mary deduces that Queen Elizabeth really wants to stay dead. However, Claire says that there is no way for her to know this without talking to her first, and says that what she tried to build was not a mistake, and finally, she reveals that she is unhappy with seeing Mary wanting to let things end like this. And then Claire tells them to put Crimson in his place and get Mary's queen back, and the girl thanks her for her words and extends her hand to her, concluding this agreement, and besides, Mary promises. But Claire says she will take care of it with pride, and asks the girl to focus on resolving the issues surrounding her life, well, Shadow breaks into a room, where there are countless shiny treasures, and he says he expected nothing less from vampire treasures. And he comments about having had a slight impression of having met his sister on the way, however, he says that she is capable of taking care of herself, well, he against a famous painting, and decides not to take it, as he already has many, and when picking up a jewel, Shadow says that it can be quite difficult to handle it when it has already been embedded in things. And then he ignores the jewelry too, and feels that his goals are very limited, until he comes across a coin the size of a 500 yen piece, but worth 100,000 yen, and he focuses his eyes on that object. Because it is very efficient because it is ready to use, in addition to being portable, and Shadow makes an analogy with Epsilon, saying that the girl fills her chest with goo, while he fills her goo with coins. Well, he takes a considerable amount of money, we're talking 100 million yen, but since he intends to live well over 300 years, Shadow says that that amount of money won't be enough for him. But he remembers that there will be a boss battle, so he starts a new operation, whose objective is to start the last boss battle before the named characters appear. So they are impressed with his skill and wonder if they can fight like him, and so he ends his narcissistic thoughts, saying that this time the announced boss is a super powerful vampire. And then he starts thinking about what grand entrance he should make, well, Crimson looks at Elizabeth's remains, and says that she was all destroyed, being reduced to just her heart. And he says that even so, his queen is beautiful, and promises that the two of them will paint the world in blood once again, as this is the appropriate night for it, he then places her heart in Sid, ordering her to return to life, 
for them to establish their marriage. Then an explosion occurs at the top of the castle, and amidst the dust, Shadow appears, saying that the time to wake up is close, as the frenzy has already begun. And this was another video on the channel. If you liked it and want more videos like this, subscribe and leave a like, see you in the next one.